Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. In today's video, I'm gonna walk you through the basics of the balance sheet from my perspective as a corporate controller. And if you've been following the channel, you know that I started out my career in public accounting, working at PwC, and then I transitioned out to work in uh, private accounting and currently work as a corporate controller. And so the way I'm gonna show you the balance sheet today and the basics of the balance sheet is the same way that I train any uh, new junior members who join my team in the accounting department. And so when we provide management and investors at the end of the financial period, we provide them with three financial reports, the balance sheet, the income statement, and the statement of cash flow. And these three statements are interconnected. Uh, there's a connection between all three. I have a video actually on how the data flows between the three statements. I'll leave a link in the description below. You can watch it after this video. But basically, the balance sheet is a financial report that provides information on the financial health of the company, so the financial position of the company. The income statement provides information on the revenues and expenses and net profit for the company. And the statement of cash flow or the cash flow statement kind of connects the two together and begins from beginning cash and then layers in the net income from the income statement and then provides all of the other activity that's happening with cash, which is cash from operating activity, financing um, and investing activities, and then provides the cash at the end of the period, which would then tie into the cash that's being displayed on the balance sheet. So these are the three statements that we provide management and investors at the end of each financial period. And the difference between the balance sheet and the other two financial reports is that the balance sheet looks at the financial position of the company at a snapshot in time as opposed to a period of time. So the balance sheet, when you look at it, it's usually as of a certain date. So as of year end or month end versus the income statement and the statement of cash flow looks at the period ending. So if you look at that income statement, it will say for the period ending X, Y, Z, the date of that, the end of the period, right? So the difference, that's the major distinction between the balance sheet and the income statement and statement of cash flow, that the balance sheet looks at it from a point in time, a snapshot in time. So that's easy enough to understand, right? The balance sheet is as of a snapshot in time or the end of the accounting period. Now, what goes into the actual balance sheet? So what goes into the balance sheet is assets, liabilities, and equity. And so assets equals liabilities plus equity. And we call this the basic accounting equation. Uh, quite frankly, if you understand this concept here, you understood half of accounting, right? So this is really important, right? And it's really easy to grasp. And let me show you. So the reason why this makes a lot of sense is that assets is what the company owns, right? So this is what you own, you know, cash, uh, receivables, property. This is what the company owns. It always has to equal what the company owes, right? So what does the company owe here? Liability. So liability is owed to vendors and third parties, right? Plus equity. Who does the company owe the equity to? to the shareholders, right? So the reason why these two are equal here, these two sides of the scale are equal, is because in order for the company to go out and acquire these assets, it needs financing, right? Where does the company get its financing, right? So the cash has to begin either from a liability, so the company takes out a loan or uh, has an accounts payable to a vendor, so that's the sort of financing, right? You owe money to a vendor. Uh, or equity financing, right? So equity financing means that the shareholders infuse cash into the company, right? So the, sor the source of financing to assets is always gonna com be coming from liabilities and equity, and that's why these two are equal, right? They're always gonna equal. It's not a concept that we make up as, account as accountants that these two sides are equal. This is a very natural concept that these two sides are always gonna be equal. So like I said, if you understand this concept, uh, you understood half of accounting, so it's really important for you to understand the basic accounting equation, assets equals liabilities plus equity. All right, so that's the basic accounting equation. Now, in order for us to understand uh, the balance sheet clearly, we'll go through an example. And because this video is filmed using an iPhone, I think it's very appropriate for us to use Apple as an example for a balance sheet. So we're gonna walk through the uh, balance sheet of Apple and kind of ex explain the different concepts we see on the balance sheet. And then I'm gonna talk to you about a sneaky type of liability. And this is a liability that only usually savvy investors are, are able to spot the danger of this liability that sits on the balance sheet. And it's sort of a, uh, a wolf that is dressed in a sheep's clothes and so we'll talk about this uh, type of liability afterwards. And then I'm going to show you how we accountants create the balance sheet using the tri balance. So this is all coming right up. But before we do any of this, I'm going to grab some coffee. I know I need some. And then I'll see you after that. All 
All right, now let's take a look at Apple's balance sheet as a really good example of a balance sheet and the different components and mechanics and what goes into it. So when we look at a balance sheet, the first thing we should be looking at is the date. So this balance sheet here is comparing two periods together, comparing the period ending June 29th, 2019 to the period ending September 29th, 2018. Okay, that's the first thing. The second is that the balance sheet is broken into two major sections, right? So you have assets on one side and then the other side you have liabilities and shareholders equity. Right, so these two uh, totals needs to match, needs to equal. So the total assets as of the most recent period here is 322 million compared to total um, liabilities and shareholders equity also of 322 million. And obviously this is the first thing that will stop you. If you notice on any kind of balance sheet that the two sides are not equal, you know that there's a problem right there. But obviously this is from a 10K from Apple. So Apple is not gonna make that rookie mistake and have a mismatch between the two numbers, right? So assets will always equal liabilities and shareholders equity. The second thing you'll notice here is that the assets and liabilities are broken down between current and non-current. And what current means is that this is something that's gonna materialize within 12 months or less than a year, right? Non-current is longer than a year. So the reason why the company breaks it down between current and non-current, for example, for assets, is that so management and investors can know which resources the company has that can be converted into cash within 12 months versus the longer term resources, right? And the same thing on the liability side, management and investors would wanna know which liabilities are imminent or will materialize within 12 months versus the longer term debt or longer term liabilities, right? So this is the second observation. So when we look at current assets, um, the first thing we'll see is cash and cash equivalents. And so usually with smaller companies, when a company starts out, they usually have cash. And what cash is, is simply the checking and saving account that the company has, right? But then as the company grows, uh, the company will have excess cash to invest in other forms, um, what we call cash equivalents. And these are things mostly is money market accounts, right? So money market accounts is another way for the company to park its cash and make a few basis points in, in, in interest income. So cash equivalents will include money market accounts because money market accounts typically is convertible to cash on demand, right? Versus, for example, CDs, right? So certificates of deposits. So can it be included in cash, in, uh, cash equivalents? Well, the answer is that it depends on the actual contract itself for the CD. So if it's convertible to cash on demand, then it is a cash equivalent. But if it's not convertible to cash on demand, uh, then it will be some sort of a short-term investment are not cash and cash equivalent. It will still be a current asset because you can convert it to cash in less than 12 months, but it's not gonna be cash and cash equivalent. Okay, what about cryptocurrency? Is cryptocurrency a cash equivalent? So I have a whole video on the treatment of cryptocurrency on the balance sheet and the income statement, the gain and loss from cryptocurrency and the income statement. So I'll link to that down below in the description. But basically the short answer is that cryptocurrency is not currently under GAAP in 2021. It's not considered a cash or cash equivalent. Cryptocurrency sits as an intangible asset. And you may think it's fair or not fair for that treatment. I personally think it's unfair. I think it's close to being a cash equivalent, uh, but currently the gap rules says that it's an intangible asset, so it doesn't sit here. Okay, so as we go down the list in current assets, we'll see marketable securities sitting in current assets. So these are usually securities such as uh, stocks or bonds that are convertible to cash within 12 months. And then you have accounts receivable net. And obviously accounts receivable is recorded here, even though it's Apple. So when you buy from Apple, most of the time, it's a, it's a, a credit card transaction. And so there's always a time lag between the actual sale, the sale could happen on a certain date, but then the cash is settling in the bank uh, or received after a few days. And so the company will record an accounts receivable. And the reason why they say net What's net here, it's net of allowance for doubtful accounts. Usually company would reduce the amount of what they think they would receive uh, by the amount that they think is, or the estimate, it's not gonna be collected, right? So that's required by GAAP, is that you always have to record um, a reduction or an offset to accounts receivable, and so it's presented here as net. And then we have inventories. Obviously inventories for a company like Apple is gonna be finished goods, work in process, uh, raw material, packaging material, all of that good stuff, right? All right, let's take a look at non-current assets. And the first thing we'll see is marketable securities. So this is most likely securities that are not convertible to cash within 12 months. This will take longer than 12 months. This could include things that have a contract, that the company has a certain contract that cannot be broken before 12 months. So that will go here. 
And then you have uh, property, plant, and equipment. So this one is self-explanatory. This is any property the company owns, equipment, and all of that stuff. And it's also presented uh, net, so net of depreciation or accumulated depreciation. So the company will take an accumulated depreciation against all of these items uh, and record it as net. And then you have non-current assets, and that could include some intangible assets. So intangible means that you cannot touch it. So this could be patent, this could be uh, goodwill, this could be intangible that we talked about cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency is an intangible asset, so that uh, could very well be sitting here. It's just that this line item is not broken down with what's included, but usually these are the kind of items that go in here. All right, let's look at liabilities and shareholders equity. And again, the same idea, liabilities are gonna be broken down between current and non-current. Current being liabilities that were materialized before 12 months and non-current liabilities are gonna be longer than 12 months. Okay, so for current liabilities, the first one is accounts payable. Obviously self-explanatory. This is what you owe to vendors for the supplies that you're buying to run the business, okay? And then you have other uh, current liabilities this is going to be most likely accrued expenses. The reason why a company would record the liability for accrued expenses, these are expenses for which the invoice haven't been received. So we haven't gotten an invoice yet from the vendor to record an accounts payable, but we record an accrued uh, liability for it. So this is other current liabilities. And then we have deferred revenue. So deferred revenue uh, also is referred to as unearned revenue. So this is the uh, funds that the company receive from customers for services and products that will be delivered in the future. Right. So the reason why it's a liability is because you receive the cash, but you still have the obligation to deliver on the goods or the service in the future. Right. So it's a it's a liability. It sits here in current liabilities. Right. And then you have commercial paper. So commercial paper most likely means that the company has uh, taken out commercial paper with investors and owes these funds to the investors in the future and is paying the investor some kind of interest. So there is usually some kind of interest expense associated with commercial paper. Right. And then you have term debt. Term debt is basically a loan that the company's taken from a lender. Uh, but the reason why it's sitting here in current liabilities is because this most likely is the portion of the loan or the loans that are due within 12 months, right? As opposed to when you look at the non-current side of the liabilities, you'd also see term debt, right? But term debt here is longer term. So this is the portion of the debt that is due beyond 12 months. Okay, so basically this is the current liabilities and the non-current liabilities we kind of touched on briefly with the term debt here, that this is the kind of debt that is due beyond 12 months. And then as we said before, the total liabilities and equity is gonna always equal total assets because what you own assets equals what you owe, which is liabilities plus shareholders equity. So now that we walked through the balance sheet for Apple Inc, I wanna to talk to you about the sneaky type of liability that I mentioned at the beginning of the video. And we'll look at the balance sheet for Apple Inc again under the current liabilities section, the item deferred revenue. And the reason why from my experience as a controller, deferred revenue is a tricky one for investors and for management is because a lot of times when you read the, the balance sheet, you're looking at deferred revenue in a positive light. Uh, because it has the word revenue in it. So it says deferred revenue, you immediately think is a positive for the company. And in many ways it is, it's good to receive the cash up front and then deliver the product or service later in the future, given that you can manufacture the product or provide the service, right? So this is the big issue here or the obligation is that if you're unable for whatever reason, a technological challenge or short staffed or anything like that, unable to provide the product or service in the future, this becomes a liability for the company. And if you break the agreement with the customer, you can be sued for it, right? So you have to surrender the cash back. So it's a liability. It says the word revenue in it, but it's a liability for the company. It's an obligation to deliver something in the future. So that's what I meant by this being a sneaky liability or a wolf dressed in a sheep's clothes. So now that we looked at this, I'm gonna walk you through how to create the balance sheet or how we as accountants create the balance sheet from the triad balance. So let's take a look at that. The process of preparing the balance sheet begins with the triad balance. 
The try balance is the representation of the ending balance of each of the general ledger accounts at the end of the period. And so the example we're looking at here is the try balance as of January 31st, 2020. And the way that we begin compiling the balance sheet is compiling and adding together the like accounts. So here we have a Chase checking and a Chase savings. And so this is the cash. So this will go together and added into the cash balance that goes in the balance sheet. And then we go down the list and grab the ending balance of the accounts receivable and then inventory. And then on the liability side, we'll grab the ending balance of accounts payable, the loan payable, and then for shareholders equity, we'll grab the balance for common stock, additional paid in capital, and then retained earnings. And then for the uh, revenue and expense item, what we do is we take the net of revenue and expenses, and that becomes the addition to retained earnings. So this is the current period retained earnings, which gets added to return earning balance from the prior periods. And that's how we go through the trial balance and prepare the balance sheet. I hope that you found this video to be helpful and a good overview of the basics of the balance sheet. And if you did, go ahead and give a thumbs up and please go ahead and share it with as many friends, family, coworkers as possible and share the knowledge. And I'll see you in the next video.